Hey guys, Jess Navarro is here for the Dallas Cowboys or PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast. Uh, sorry, it has been a week. Uh, it's been a week enough that I'm sure you all can understand uh, where my mindset is. I'm sure you're right there with me. The Dallas Cowboys season officially coming to an end. And, and not just coming to an end. I don't think that's what's been so problematic, to say at the very least, for everybody. It's coming to the end in the fashion uh, in which it did. So in this episode, we'll talk about kind of the downfalls in the uh, wild card round against the Packers. We'll talk about Mike's job security. And you know what? We'll just see where this conversation takes us. Uh, it is just me for your host today. So hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Don't forget to go give us all five stars wherever you listen to your podcast and leave nice comments. Uh, it's been a rough week for all of us uh, here in Dallas. So just keep that in mind. We're going to discuss this. We're going to think of this as like a therapy session uh, for all of us today because it was a rough one. Dallas Cowboys ending their season 48-32, the final score um, for this wild card matchup that really had everything set for the Cowboys going into it. This was a matchup that the Cowboys should have won on paper. They were seven point favorites for a reason. They had the veteran talent. They had the higher seating. Everything was lined up for the Cowboys to win this one, and they just didn't. They didn't win. They didn't execute. And actually, it really is kind of shocking the parallels you can draw back to the issues that plagued them last season uh, that got them out of the playoffs again against the 49ers. And so um, that's obviously an issue, and that's obviously problematic. And so let's uh, let's get into that discussion because – Man, there's a, unfortunately a lot to talk about, and it's not uh, very good. So starting with the Cowboys offense, this was such an interesting game for this Cowboys offense because all season you heard about the West Coast offense, which is very pass-heavy, and you kind of saw that persistently throughout the season. And even when there were games when CeeDee Lamb wasn't a predominant threat, you had guys like Brandon Cook stepping up, uh, Jake Ferguson, who unfortunately had a fantastic game, and that's going to be forgotten about uh, because of the fashion in which they lost. But in this game, there was one thing I noticed kind of off the bat, and that was the lack of control and really the, the lack of cadence that Dak Prescott has built, the yeah, here we go, has been built and become this staple uh, for Dak. And during this game, it was such a non-factor because it just didn't look like the Dak you've seen throughout the course of the regular season. Um, so I saw that early on. I noticed just how obvious it was, and I don't think it was due to the offensive line not performing. In fact, I think the offensive line was the only job or only group that did their job as a whole uh, and did it predominantly well, despite the sacks. They weren't in the pocket uh, when they did happen. But I do think overall the offensive line uh, had a good game. It just obviously wasn't enough. And so um, what you did see from this Cowboys offense was a very slow, slow start uh, to this game. And, and that's kind of what came back to bite them uh, later on. But um, CD Lamb didn't get his first actual catch of the game until two minutes before halftime. Uh, the Packers found a way to completely shut out CD Lamb and the Cowboys just didn't have a response for that. And so I think that was the most frustrating thing is because in games prior where teams had tried to neutralize CD Lamb, not only did it give him time to uh, warm up, but you also got to see the usage. Uh, sorry, there's a cat over here to my left playing with the blinds, if you can hear that. Um, you also got to see the usage of Brandon Cooks, Jake Ferguson, uh, guys of that nature. But in this game, I mean, CD Lamb, these stats are so, before I say them, these stats are so deceiving to what actually happened in this game. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, 110 yards, um, Nine receptions out of 17 targets. His longest catch was 47 yards on Sunday. But guess who was right behind him? A guy that has not had a great season, who's been scrutinized um, as being disappointing throughout the season. But well, he showed up when it mattered. And I think that goes, uh, it is worth noting here. Michael Gallup was six for six in targets and receptions, 103 yards. His longest was 42 yards. And so... Um, I, I think it's so interesting that 
this game sh- kind of played out like it did and things shook out like they did because um, the receiving game didn't pick up until the second half. And at that point, even uh, the Packers had taken their starters out and you're kind of playing against uh, their second stringers at that point. So uh, Jake Ferguson, I mentioned earlier, had a great game, 93 yards, three touchdowns uh, as well. But that's going to be completely erased because of the outcome of the game. What I thought was interesting here was Mike McCarthy's um, play calling in the sense that he hasn't tried to predominantly run the ball all season. And yes, the Packers were a very, a very vulnerable run defense. And so it would make sense that you would see it a little bit more, but not the sole way of attack that uh, you lean on. And so I thought it was very interesting um, that Mike McCarthy decided to call the plays in the sense that he um, was going to lean on the run more than the passing game. And I just, I, I find it so interesting because Tony Pollard, yeah, he had, he had a great game. Uh, let's see, 56 rushing yards, one touchdown. His longest was 11 yards uh, as far as his rushing. Dak Prescott had 45 rushing yards. Rico Dowdle had 11. Brandon Cooks had six. CeeDee Lamb had five. Um, but you were really leaning on the run a lot in this game. And, and I think the most frustrating thing was you were leaning on the run on early downs and you were kind of putting yourself in second and long, third and long situations, which you just could not come back from at that point. And what's worth noting is that the Packers offense was not putting pressure on Dak up front. It was it was just kind of bizarre, uh, their point of attack. And, and it was more just bullying Dak uh, in, in the secondary and taking advantage of those weaknesses there. Uh, uh, it, it just looked like this offense didn't have good communication. There was a lack of separation. There was missed routes. Um, and like I said, it kind of takes you back to the playoff loss against the 49ers last season. Um, so I thought it was just interesting how Green Bay decided to attack Dak. Of course, Dak also proved all year, shut down the conversations of interceptions. He had two costly interceptions. Um, in this game. And so that was also frustrating to watch. Um, haven't had the chance to go back and really watch them to see who was at fault, kind of what happened uh, frame by frame. But ultimately, you can't have those. You can't have turnovers uh, happening when your offense isn't scoring and then go into the defense now. You can't have that when the defense isn't generating turnovers on their end. They're not creating pressure and they're allowing explosive plays to happen uh, yet again. And so as far as this Cowboys defense, I mean, first of all, let's start with the fact that it is completely unacceptable to allow 48 points to be scored with zero, zero turnovers in this game, zero force fumbles, uh, zero interceptions. It was actually really uncharacteristic. I want to call it uh, for what you've seen this Dan Quinn run offense uh, be capable of doing. So I really wonder um, if, you know, you're the Cowboys front office, you look at that and and how, how you go about, um, how do I say this? How, how you go about acting um, forward, uh, what you do, the decisions you make. I'm trying to look up some stats here. So don't mind me. Uh, this is a little hard to do solo when I'm trying to talk to you guys, multitask uh, and look up some stats. Um, but I did want to see... Let's see. I'm trying to pull up some numbers here. I'm so sorry. Um, zero sacks in this game. Our, there were quarterback hits, but uh, none officially registered as a sack. Micah had one. Osa had one. Dorrance had one. Um, Damone Clark had one tackle for loss. J. Ron Curse had one pass deflection. And that's about it. But in a game like this, those stats aren't good enough for a win. And, and obviously, because they didn't come out with a win, but... Um, what I worry about for this defense is at the start of the season, uh, Mike McCarthy had talked about the identity of this team leaning on the defense and what it's capable of doing. And that's okay. But I also think what needed to happen is there needed to be some kind of evolution uh, to teams kind of finding a counter punch for you. And I think as time has gone on, it's become more predictable um, what the defensive scheme is under Dan Quinn. I don't necessarily see the necessary adjustments um, to counter punch people having more tape on you. And so it's, there's plenty of blame to go around for this entire team in, in this game, but 
for me, uh, the, the defensive blame starts with Dan Quinn and it trickles all the way down to the execution, the lack of efforts. And then again, the same kind of things that plagued you before the run defense, Aaron Jones, just completely uh, feeling like he was trying to run back to green Bay with uh, let's see, he had 118 yards and 21 attempts uh, and three touchdowns in this game, just absolutely creating his home away from home at AT AT&T stadium um, again. And it's just crazy because again, we all knew all week being at the star, that's all we were asking the players about was Aaron Jones and how do you stop him? And, and seemingly it it felt like they had the answers. And so to see this kind of performance from the run defense and, you know, we were even kind of more hopeful because AJ Dillon was not active in this game. Um, it, it was disappointing to say at the very least. It was disappointing considering you're pretty much healthy aside from Gilly, who was uh, Stefan Gilmore, who was playing um, with a shoulder issue and he had a harness on. Other than that, you were pretty healthy going into this game. The only guy that was list- listed as questionable beforehand was Cooper Rush with an illness, and then he ended up being active uh, come game day. And so there, there was just no excuse for the run defense playing as poor as it did. I think early on you saw Demarcus Lawrence kind of sniffing it out and reading, and then as time went on, it just became more and more deflating, and then you saw the lack of effort um, to really bring it back to life. And um, there was just no momentum shifts from the defense at all. There was no momentum shifts uh, that led to anything that they needed in order to win uh, no interceptions. Like I mentioned, which is just absolutely unacceptable considering the middle of the field was just left vulnerably open on a consistent basis. And Jordan love knew it. He attacked it and he continued to just uh, really embarrass the Cowboys secondary. So um, I think this off season, it, it'll be interesting to see how the Cowboys Defense is uh, addressed as far as adding strength and numbers. The Cowboys do have, I believe, 14 free agents uh, going up into free agency this offseason. And um, I, I will pull up that list for you, actually, now that we're talking about it, because it's important to mention just how different um, this team is going to look come next year. And you can't really do anything about that. There's only so much cap room um, you can you can utilize. And there are some guys that you absolutely need to make sure you lock down on their bigger contracts. C.D. Lamb, Micah Parsons, Dak Prescott's extension. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, in this NFL business, you're not going to be able to retain the guys you want to retain um, in, in free agency. So those players uh, that I mentioned going into free agency are Tyler Biotish, Rico Dowdle, Neville Gallimore, Chume Doga, Trent Sag, Jonathan Hankins, Noah Igbenogany, Dante Fowler, J. Ron Curse, Dorrance Armstrong, Jordan Lewis, Stephon Gilmore, Tony Pollard, and Tyron Smith. So two of your starting offensive linemen, both of your running backs, uh, you have a starting safety Uh, Two of your safeties, Jordan Lewis, not so much a starter. You have a starting cornerback in Gilly. Um, Jonathan Hankins was a big patch for the run defense. You have a lot of really much needed talent and depth uh, heading into the free agency. And so figuring out a way to retain as much talent as you can, if you feel like that's the direction you want to go, if you're the front office is going to be vital, Uh, but also shopping around in free agency. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to say excited, I'm interested. I think that's the better word to see how the front office attacks free agency. Last year, um, you saw the trades happen for Stephon Gilmore and Brandon Cooks. I think those were phenomenal trades that paid dividends even until the last second um, of the game on Sunday. And so uh, if the Cowboys could figure out a way to lock down Stephon Gilmore once again, I think Mm -hmm. that would be uh, ideal. Stephon Gilmore having surgery uh, this week, according to a report from the Dallas Morning News, um, because of that shoulder injury uh, that he was playing with. And so I I don't think that'll be an impact um, on whether he's able to play or not next season. Unfortunately, there's a long offseason. There's plenty of time there. Um, I wrote an article about this, and if you want to go check it out on uh, profootballnetwork.com in the Cowboys sector, I talked a lot about how um, 
the impact Stephon Gilmore made, but also when it comes to being aggressive and free agency, how vital that's going to be for this Cowboys team who, I mean, realistically, you're probably going to lose about 20 to 25 percent of your talent. You're just not going to be able to retain all of it. And so um, being able to keep Gilmore would would be ideal, especially because you have Trayvon Diggs, who's coming back from a torn ACL. Um, and typically when you see a guy with a torn ACL, it, it takes about a year for them to fully feel like themselves again um, to play football. And I think a lot of people forget that, yes, you can recover from a torn ACL rather quickly, especially with the rehab opportunities the Cowboys have at the star uh, under Britt Brown, who's done phenomenal things for this team. But to play football again it is a whole different beast when it comes to rehabbing and training your body to do things in different ways, knowing that your body is is different now and it's healing from that kind of injury. And so um, I, I think you need a guy like Stephon Gilmore to come back on this team. He's a phenomenal locker room leader. Uh, the guys look up to him. And even before the playoff game, uh, Tank Lawrence was talking about how Gilly does not say much. He is a very quiet guy, but when he does, you listen because you just know something important. And he even described it as when things are going wrong, you look over to Stefan to see what he's going to tell you and it, and it helps motivate you a little bit more. And so I think if you have a guy like that on your team, that's made an obvious impact, you do what you can to keep him. So I'll be interested to see if the Cowboys front office pursues anything uh, to keep Stefan Gilmore for uh, the upcoming season. As for the other names, uh, your starting offensive lineman, Tyron Smith, I, I think is an interesting name because, again, we all know he has not played a full season in uh, nearly 10 years of his career because of injury. But we also know how dominant the left side of the line is with him and Tyler Smith when he is fully healthy. Um, the veteran rest days that the Cowboys have given him throughout the course of the season, both him and Zach Martin, that is, um, and even Tank Lawrence, they they all got their veteran rest days on Wednesdays, paid dividends and really extended his playing time, I think, throughout this season. Um, and, you know, they found ways around working through his injuries and him being a little more injury prone uh, than other players. But again, is it time? It's that conversation once again in the offseason. Is it time to start exploring different options there um, for that position. Tyler Biotish, your starting center. Um, I, I think he's performed phenomenally this season. I think the chemistry him and Dak Prescott have goes a little unnoticed and it is a little underappreciated uh, for the amount of work that those two put in together. So I'll be interested to see what the Cowboys front office decides on that as well. Uh, but one thing is for sure, your running back room is going to look completely different next year uh, with both Rico Dowdle and Tony Pollard in free agency now. Rico uh, was dealing with a little bit of an ankle injury all season. You wouldn't know. He still continued to have his burst. He ran angry. And he didn't get as many touches um, as you would like to him like him to have or you would like to see from him um, being the team's second running back um, and kind of coming off of a very successful one-two punch season with um, – Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard prior. And so I think it was a little disappointing to see the lack of usage from Rico um, over the course of the season. But Tony Pollard, again, he was on that franchise tag this season. Um, he didn't start to really look like himself until the Washington game, the final week of the regular season. And he did look like himself in this playoff game. If you want to find a little uh, silver lining in the loss, but is that enough for him to get a, a contract from the Cowboys front office? Do they shop around for another running back in free agency? Uh, do they look into a trade somehow? Or do they draft somebody? I, I mean, there's so many options here um, that you could go with. And so if anything, you can guarantee it's how different this running back room um, can look come next season. So unfortunately, the Cowboys season is done. and. One conversation I wanted to make sure to get into is who does that fall on? Who does this early shocking loss fall on? Because this is a Cowboys team that had all of the talent to go forward. Um, this was a Cowboys team that you believed and they still had the talent to get past that cursed divisional round 
uh, playoff game this season. This was the team that was expected to get them to the NFC championship after a nearly 30 year drought of not getting there. Um, and so how do you change this? Because this is now the narrative that you are working with is you can have all the talent in the regular season. You can have three straight 12 win seasons and it's not enough. And it's not enough to give you what you want come postseason. So how do you fix that? Where does the blame lie? Do you clean house? Do you not? So obviously now um, Mike McCarthy's job security is being questioned. And like I mentioned earlier, I think there was only one scenario where that happened. Because I think going into this game, although there was some speculation and, and media coverage on Jerry um, in insinuating otherwise, I really didn't think personally that it was at question. I, I really thought Mike had job security uh, no matter what had happened, even if they had lost this game. However, your nightmare scenario in all of this is the fashion in which they lost this game. Because this, to me, you look back at current playoff losses from the Cowboys, to me, this is your worst playoff loss in a very, very long time, in, in modern times for this Cowboys team. And you can't just allow that. There has to be change somewhere, but you also have to walk that tightrope of not making change just to make change. So... Mike McCarthy's job security, obviously, a question here. Um, we haven't heard any updates over here on our side in Dallas. There has been no um, press conference scheduled with him, uh, as there is at the end of every season. But again, that's still typical as well because they were finishing uh, their exit interviews this week. So we're kind of in limbo waiting on that. Uh, Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones did not appear on 105.3 The Fan, as they would sometimes to do a season wrap-up. But I did see one of the guys tweet out that that's just a courtesy because technically their contract negotiations end when the season ends. And so I think a lot of people are trying to look into things to read into the tea leaves, but really there's just not movement right now. And I think with a decision like this, if you are going to clean house, it's not one that you just make out of emotions. And so um, I expect it to kind of be sitting and waiting for a few days. And so that's why this podcast is being recorded on Wednesday uh, instead of our usual Mondays, because I wanted to see if any news would break uh, prior and it still hasn't. And so if uh, that changes by the time you're listening to this, I'm so sorry. Um, but here's my opinion. Here's my opinion on the entire Mike McCarthy situation, because I don't think you fire Mike McCarthy. And maybe that's a hot take uh, for you. If you're listening to this and you're saying, Jess, what, what are you talking about? Hear me out. If you fire Mike McCarthy, you are putting Dak Prescott in a situation to have three different play callers in three years. Dak Prescott is not getting any younger here. He continues to get older um, in, in his career, in his life. He's 30 years old now. Um, he will be going into his ninth season. Expecting a quarterback to be successful when you continually change the scheme around him over and over and over again, three coordinators in three years, three play callers in three years, I don't think is setting Dak up for success. And yes, I know a lot of people are scrutinizing Dak right now, wondering if he should even uh, be the team starting quarterback, if he is that guy. Here's the thing. Dak Prescott has to be that guy right now because you don't have another option to fall back on. Um, you could draft somebody. Sure, you could acquire somebody in free agency. But again, like we were just talking about, there's only so much cap space you can utilize. And I'm not defending uh, the Cowboys front office in any way. I'm just saying, based on how you have seen patterns in the past of how the front office spends their money, it's just not likely you acquire another quarterback in free agency via trade or anything like that. The likely scenario is you grab a quarterback in the draft and then you start the draft and develop process. But that still means you're still left with Dak being your guy. If that's the case, you have to do what you can to set him up for success. You cannot ignore the success that he had with Mike McCarthy's play calling throughout the course of the regular season, putting him in the MVP conversation multiple times. Dak having his best season since probably his rookie season when you go back and you look at it statistics-wise. Um, Dak... 
and Mike have revitalized this Cowboys offense this season, getting them to this point in the playoffs. But again, execution uh, in the playoffs obviously led to an early exit for the Cowboys. However, I digress. My point is, you if you really are sticking with Dak as your guy, which I think they have to at this point, you have to set him up for success. The only way to do that is to keep it consistent and you keep Mike McCarthy around. I'm not saying you keep him around long term. Uh, as far as job security goes for years and years, I think if you keep him around, you give him a very clear understanding and clear warning. If you're Jerry Jones, that this is your last shot, you get us to that NFC championship or this is it for you. And I think, honestly, I think that kind of goes without being said, but I don't think you blow up um, everything completely and start fresh because where your quarterback is in his career right now, you're pretty much setting the entire team back by doing that uh, to a certain extent. Personally, I think if you're looking at job security and who would be under fire, um, if anybody, it's your defensive coordinator. And I know that's a very unpopular opinion because everybody um, is very gung-ho for Dan Quinn. I'm a big Dan Quinn gal uh, myself. Mm -hmm respect the hell out of him and what he's been able to do for the Cowboys defense. But if you're spreading blame around, you cannot tell me that it is acceptable to have 48 points and no turnovers in a playoff game from your uh, defense. It was completely run all over by the Packers. Um, so to me, I, I think if any position is kind of under scrutiny, it's, it's Dan's. And even then, he had five head coaching interviews lined up this week, so he might be out the door anyways. Um, no official word on that yet, and we'll keep you posted if something does happen. But it's just unacceptable to me that you have a defense looking like that. Uh, and and you look at it, yes, they were your, your dominant force by the start of the season, but then you also look at the games that the Cowboys did lose throughout the course of the regular season. Yes, the offense was to blame for some of them, but the most predominant issues in those losses, lack of turnovers from the Cowboys defense uh, and run defense, which issues galore and, and penalties, which we didn't even get into in this game, the costly penalties um, that continue to plague this entire team. And so to me, I think your changes come on the defensive side. Uh, you can't really put a lot of blame on Brian Schottenheimer, considering he doesn't have that much control of the offense as the OC because Mike's calling the plays. Um, but I don't think you fire Mike McCarthy. And I'm interested to see what happens. Y'all don't have to agree with me. I know a lot of you probably won't. Um, but I stand where I stand in this, in that you don't fire McCarthy, and Dak is still your guy until you find your next um, guy that you start training and developing because you also don't want to throw somebody out there that's just not ready for it and that is not uh, prepared in the ways you need him to be. So, yeah, um, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Like I said, we'll keep you posted um, if any news breaks throughout the week. It's just been such a weird week as, um, honestly, nobody expected to have to do this this week. You didn't expect to have to record this episode this week. Uh, personally, the guys at the star didn't expect to have to be cleaning out their lockers and it sucks. It sucks that this is how the season ended. We have a long, long, long off season, um, that feels even longer because of the way that the Cowboys lost. But, uh, that just means our draft coverage will start and we have all of that to look forward to, um, and from there, I think uh, when draft season starts, things go by fairly quickly uh, to get us back into the fun part of the off season, which is OTAs, mini camp, training camp, all that good stuff. But until then, um, this one hurts. This this loss stings, and especially when you saw the talent that this Cowboys team did have. So uh, I'm right there with you guys and feeling the postseason depression kind of hit. I'm going to be right there with you guys as we watch the playoffs from the couch, knowing that the Cowboys uh, definitely at their full potential could have been, I, I think, every but one uh, team on the NFC side of the playoff bracket that is left. Um, so it, it's disappointing, but we're all in it together. We all have each other to lean on. 
Um, so we'll continue to do that. But thank you guys for a phenomenal season uh, and supporting us throughout the regular season. Uh, I know Dalton is not here on this podcast, but me personally, I can say I've appreciated all of your love and support as it was my first season covering the Cowboys full time uh, as a writer here for PFN. And it was a challenge of a lifetime, but I loved every second of it. I love covering this team for you guys, and I love giving you stories uh, that deserve to have a platform. And it's just been so much fun, even when it was hard and uh, challenging for me. So thank you so much for giving me uh, that love and support. I appreciate you guys so, so much. Enjoy the rest of your week as much as you possibly can. I know we're all still in mourning, um, but sun will come up at some point. We're going to be okay. And uh, like I said, we're all in this together. So thank you all so much for listening. Like I said earlier in the episode, please make sure to go leave us all five stars with your review. Let us know what you think. And I will be back here next week uh, with another episode of the Dallas PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast. I don't know if we'll have news by then or not, but we could. And if we do, we'll talk all about it. Have a great rest of your week. Appreciate the heck out of you. Bye guys.